All right, we're live on the internet. This is the DevOps and Docker show. I am your host, Brett Fisher. Today I've got special guest, Michael Irwin, and we're gonna be talking about lots of things. Thanks for sticking around. We had a couple of technical issues. Step one is never update your software right before you go live. That's just a recipe for disaster. Also, never deploy on Fridays. That's also a, not a recommended thing. Although, I don't know, nowadays we probably should be deploying on Fridays because we're cool and we deploy all the time. Every day. Uh, so if you haven't been here before, this is a show where basically we spend an hour talking about uh, all things, the cloud, DevOps, containers, uh, you know, sysadmin stuff, deploying software, running stuff locally on your machine, you name it, mostly about containers and Docker. But we talk about all that stuff. So get your questions in early. We will try to answer questions in the order of chat. And so if you were in the video and the chat has reset for you, Go ahead and ask your question again in case the chat hasn't rolled over, just to make sure that your question gets in the pool of questions we will get to. And first up, we're going to talk through some stuff, news, things happening. And then Michael's got a great demo on a new thing that came out of Docker last year, essentially, called Docker App that I'm excited for him to talk about. And we're going to get started. So the, the format of this show is every week. So in case you're new to this channel or new to this live, just click on the subscribe button and click that little bell. You'll get notified whenever I go live and you might see people like Michael on the call. And I call this a call. It's really a stream, but I'm old. So why not call it a conference call? Because that's what we always used to call it. Um, so uh, first up, if you're not aware of my resources, I have a bunch of resources that we'll get to later when I show the web browser and we get into fancy screen sharing stuff. But if you just go to brettfisher.com slash docker, you can see all of my resources. Most of them are free. There's a couple of paid resources in there, paid courses. The best coupons you can get are in that page. And that's the kind of stuff that helps create this show. So I'm able to do that stuff and... They say they can't hear Oh, they can't hear a mic. All right, let's fix the mic for Mike. Oh. Uh... Hello, hello. There we go. I bet you're fixed now. Okay. All right. That was me um, clicking the button to not mute you. All right. Hooray. Good job for me. Yeah. So uh, someday I'll actually get someone who's really good at this to run this show, and then we won't have these constant mess ups. Last week I had the green screen up the whole time and was talking and saying, look at this thing on the screen. And the people were like, I, I can't see your screen. I, I see a green screen. Uh, <laughs> so you never know what you're going to get here. Uh, so uh, first up, let's let's switch over to. Um, let's see, what are we gonna do? We're gonna do. Let's talk about some news, all right? And Michael, feel free to comment on any of this stuff. Sure. Uh, as you see it. Yeah, uh, and and uh, uh, Hill asking uh, if you've if you've lost the chat, then yes, because we had to restart the video stream. Uh, you might have lost the previous chat. So if you your question, if you don't see your question, go ahead and re-ask it, and then we'll just make sure that it gets in the queue. Um, so yeah, so my resources over here, brettfisher.com slash docker, and I've got a new course coming soon. The, the, we're planning on it launching this month. We'll see if I actually make that date. Uh, but if you get on the list here, there's a notification newsletter you can get on, and that way you'll know uh, that we when I launch it and you'll get the best coupon for getting that course. And basically, if you ever have any interest in Node.js, this is not the course to learn Node.js. This is not even the course to learn Docker. You're gonna take Docker Mastery for that. You're gonna take somebody's great Node.js course uh, for that. But once you know the basics about those two, the next step is like, how do I get the best out of Node for my, you know, how do I get the best out of Docker when I'm doing Node, right? How do I how do I make the two superpowers combined? Because Node.js was how I learned Docker way back in the day. Uh, it was I was using Docker to I was learning Docker really and how to use it on a Node.js project with a startup that I was co-founding. And it turns out that that startup wasn't great, but the tech we had was awesome. So we had Docker, we had Node.js. It was 2012. That was all like super bleeding cool stuff back then. So. Going to check out this course. Uh, I'm, I'm putting my best stuff in there. I'm super excited to launch it, and hopefully you'll like it. So the next thing up there is something I saw show up this week was um, Snikes. I'm not even sure how to say it. How do you say it, Mike? Snike? Sneak? Um, you know, I, I don't Snick. know either. 
Yeah, it's a made up word, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's not an English word that I would normally have. Well, well, anyway, they're a security company that does some really cool stuff around auto scanning your GitHub. Uh, they, they scan your GitHub uh, code, really, and they'll scan any other repositories, I, I'm sure, then for, for a fee. But they'll do it for free on GitHub if you have open source. And they let you know when things are outdated or if you have known vulnerabilities, CVE kind of vulnerabilities in your code, in your requirements, in your dependencies, stuff like that. And so I always enable that for all of my repos, and it's free. It doesn't cost me anything for the open source stuff. So, yeah, uh, don't know how to say it, but you should check it out. And they... <laughs> And if anybody figures it out, let us know. <laughs> yeah. If somebody could put the, I mean, and, and you know, companies like this, really, they should just like at the bottom of their homepage, or like on every page say, this is how you say our name for at least the first five years of the company, right? Yeah. So they have a really cool report that came out, uh, the state of open source security. I will post that link into chat. And I, there's a lot to it and we're not going to go through it all really. Uh, it, and the headlines aren't anything different really than every past year, because they've done this before. And it's essentially, there's vulnerable known vulnerabilities everywhere. You could summarize this thing up, right? Like there's known vulnerabilities everywhere. And you your job is to just make sure that your code is on the most current dependencies as possible, right? I mean, we all run other people's code. And so your your app, whether or not your app is secure, that's up to you, and that's different tools, right, that analyze your code and maybe find common, you know, SQL injection vulnerabilities, stuff like that. But that's not what this is about. This is about finding known vulnerabilities, CVE-listed vulnerabilities in current technologies, current open source. And really, there's, their headlines are always things like, you know, what does it say? Uh, the top 10 most popular Docker images each contain at least 30 vulnerabilities. Well, most of that is because those vulnerabilities haven't been fixed in upstream software that really has nothing to do with Docker, right? So if if there's vulnerabilities in MySQL, in the image of MySQL, that's because MySQL itself has those vulnerabilities and they haven't fixed them or updated them. Um, my experience is that Docker isn't too far behind the curve in getting those official images updated. It's really just the nature of open source software. But one of the interesting things in this report that I always like to point out uh, is that the biggest problem that people have is they're not updating their dependencies. Even if you're a shop that's really good at doing apt get update or Windows updates on a regular basis once a month, which most places are not doing that in my experience, uh, even if you're doing that, with containers, you have a new problem, which is the from image. And I think one of the great things that came out of this report, and there's probably a quote somewhere in here, is that basically if we all just went in and fixed our or updated our from images and our Docker image files, our Docker files, then a lot of this, a lot of these problems would go away. Um, let me see if I can find that quote. It was, I don't want to, top 10, no, that wasn't it. Yeah, 37, 37% of open source developers don't implement any sort of security testing during CI. Well, that's only, that's one out of three, which I think is actually pretty good. Only one out of three don't test because in my experience, it's like 80% don't test. <laughs> and 54% of developers don't do any Docker image security testing. So half, which I think is amazing that we have half that do it. That's true. Um, according to their test. Now, uh, now you got to ask, like, who are they asking? People that know about their product? Because if you even know about their product, you're probably already right tip of the spear. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so here we go. 44%, this one down here, it's kind of hard to see. 44% of scanned Docker images can fix known vulnerabilities by updating their base image tag. So almost half of all Docker images on that are open source on Docker Hub could be better, could be more secure if they just updated the from. And I'm guilty of that too, right? Like from images come out and I don't immediately know about those and go update all my stuff. So we're all a little bit imperfect in that way. Any thoughts, Michael? Yeah, I mean, uh, we run into the same thing. Sometimes it's hard to know that a an upstream image has been updated, um, and especially too if you've got a you know base images, you're using upstream images, but then you create your own base images, and you know you may have several layers of that going on depending on your organization. That it's it's hard to to keep that pipeline always flowing and, and keep everything up to date. Yeah, it is. It's a and it's a it's like we all have ingrained in our brains to do certain things daily and weekly in, in tech. Uh, 
And, you know, one of those obviously for a lot of us is email, right? Multiple times a day. Some of us are obsessed. Some of us are all about once a day, if you can control your inbox. Uh, but I feel like there's, even when you're in a small shop that doesn't have a dedicated security person that's doing this for you, it's almost like, okay, once a week, I need to have some tool that will tell me all of my from images that are outdated, all the known vulnerabilities in that I could be fixing. Because it's one thing to know about vulnerabilities that you can't really do anything about. But it's another just to say, hey, if you just simply rebuilt this image from not necessarily latest, because we all know that you shouldn't use the, the sure. word latest in production. But if you found the latest patch release of something, like I use my I use Ghost Blog, right? So I have Ghost in the Ghost Blogging Engine running brettfisher.com. They come out with a new patch release. That patch release in a base image on Docker Hub. You know, if I go over to Hub over here, Hub, and then I just go find the Ghost one. If I go to that Ghost one, uh, you know, they do a patch release quite frequently, and I don't get notified. I'm not on. I I don't. I'm not even sure. <laughs> I'm not even sure if I needed to be notified every time it happens how to do it. Um, at least not on Hub. I know how to have images auto rebuild based on other dependencies in Docker Hub, but I don't know how to be notified of a new image. The best I've come up with, uh, just being a solo person and not a big team of people, is on GitHub. If you've been on GitHub lately, in the last few months, they've added a new feature where on any app you care about or any repo, you can watch releases, which I have been using the crap out of. I don't know if you've been using that, Michael. I, you know, I've got a couple of projects that I need to cut over to that because before that I had the if this, then that recipes to be notified. So I need to switch those over to that. But Yeah, it's like watching before was way too much for a lot of yeah. things because you didn't want to know about everything. But the releases only, my little tip is that for everything I care about, so every every Docker repo that it matters, right? Uh, Docker, Moby, Moby, CE, Docker CE, uh, you know, Compose, Machine, like all the tools I use. I go in and I set the release only, and I get an email the minute they release a new version. Um, and then it also is nice because when Docker releases something, like a lot of big, good open source projects, they put the release notes in that release. And so I get the release notes in my inbox, and I can read it that's, later, and it's great. Yeah, it's very awesome. handy. I didn't know the release notes were going in there. That's cool. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it'll look just like whatever their... Um, their releases. So, for example, if everyone's uh, aware, when you if you want to know about new Docker versions, you don't actually go to Moby slash Moby because that's the upstream open source repo that eventually gets pulled into official Docker releases. But if you go over to the Docker CE releases page, and you can see like the latest version that just came out a week ago. In fact, on this chat last week, somebody put in chat that hey, a new version just came out while we were having this talk, uh, <laughs> awesome. while we were while we were streaming. And all of these notes in here that they've put in this uh, release will go into that email that I get. So it's great. I can just read it whenever I'm, you know, sitting at the vet with my new puppy. <laughs> Whatever. Yay. Uh, so uh, the way, yeah, and the way you, you all do that is you just now on the notifications list, you now get this new release only option. So I highly recommend you go check that out if it's, you know, stuff like that. So it's crazy that that's the only there's probably lots of other good ways that people know of, but that's the way I've figured out how to do it. Yeah. It doesn't help me with Docker images, but most apps that are going to be in images, this is like the pre precursor, right? Like as soon as this happens, then there'll be a D Docker hub workflow that automatically builds that image. So you kind of, yeah, you, you think there's a, an opportunity to build something there. So, yeah. I mean, I've seen it over the years. People have tried different update things, but generally things that check other websites and then email you about it. Like, yeah. um, that those things are like there's a dime. I probably could reuse uh, Zapier for that. Probably if someone's a fan yeah, of that, I think there'd be a bot. Okay, yeah, just watch this repo. Anytime the repo gets a new image, just go ahead and make an automatic pull request to this to this repo to update the Docker file. Right, that's a good. Yeah, too hard to do. that's a good point. I think um, with uh, I'm going to call. What am I going to call it today? I'm going to call it Snick. Well, so I actually, as we were doing that, I, I looked it up. There is an FAQ for, I'll post it in chat, of how do you actually pronounce it? Yeah. Is it one syllable? And so they, they said that Sinek? their CEO pronounces it sneak, while others within the team pronounce it snick, and so they, they really don't care. Snick. <laughs> so, so inside their own company. Yeah. 
Oh my goodness. How to pronounce it. Okay. Step one, how to pronounce a tool before you know, before you start using it. It's so, important for marketing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I was actually going to guess sneak and which isn't as a cool actual name for um, a security tool. So sneak. Yeah. Or and, sneak. And it actually stands for. So now, you know, Oh really? Oh, so it's an yeah. acronym. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's not just but so now, cool. but we still don't know how to say it. So <laughs> I thought it was going to be like, it's, you know, it's the Hungarian word for, you know, locking something down or, I don't know. Scan yeah. or, yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, cool. Okay, so everybody check that out. That's cool. Uh, moving on to some uh, something other random news that I thought was interesting is I get a lot of questions about the Docker Certified Associate, DCA, but also, you know, I think a, maybe a more popular one would be the Kubernetes Certified Administrator. And then there are other, because they have multiple options for certification with Kubernetes. And we are getting other people, uh, not so much with the DCA, because I haven't looked lately, but with the, the CKA and other Kubernetes certifications, we're getting people that are telling their story of how they studied and ramped up. And, and uh, I'm not a fan of cheating on tests. And I think I've kind of preached about this the other week was don't try to fake it. Like, uh, you know, the goal is that you really learn a tool, not just test prep and then go take a test. And tests, of course, are getting better at preventing us from test prepping. Back in the day, there used to be this whole thing where you could, and maybe it's still a thing, where you can go on a um, BitTorrent and download, you know, questions that people wrote after, you know, legit questions that they remembered from a test and wrote them down. And I'm not a real fan of that. Um, I would, uh, I think it's just an integrity issue. But anyway, so this guy, uh, Christian, uh, was basically going through all of his steps and all the repos he used, not just sort of some official stuff, but actually breaking down. And I thought it was a really good breakdown. It's short. It's easy. And then he references uh, other ones that are on the internet. And so if you're interested in that, uh, I definitely would read their stories and so that you know what to expect and you know whether or not you can feel like you're ready for these kind of exams. Uh, when I was at O'Reilly Conference last year, they were doing these tests at the conference. So you were going... Uh, you went You went to the conference and had these requirements, like you had to go take this course and do these things, and then you go there and you spend two whole days actually prepping with an instructor, and then at the end of the second day, they send you through the gauntlet of the exam, which I thought was really cool, uh, and the room was packed. There was an, a, a packed room of people, so oh, I'm, that's cool. yeah, that's the first time I, I don't see that very often, especially when it's not the that vendor's or that organization's conference, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I was a little jealous because I was in uh, the Docker 101 room, and they were full next door and my room was not full. So that just goes to show that people are figuring out Docker and now they need to learn Kubernetes, right? So, yeah. Yeah, um, I, haven't, I haven't worked up towards that exam yet, so. Yeah, me neither, me neither. Uh, I took the DCA as a beta, mm -hmm. but um, haven't haven't started focusing on the Kubernetes test, but maybe, maybe later this year. Yeah. Uh, the next thing, all right, and I will actually post that link. I didn't post that into chat. For those of you that are interested in the CKA or the CKD, whatever the other one is, developer something. Yeah, I think it's CKD. Yeah, so uh, the last thing I'll mention here is that something that came up the other week. I think it was last week someone asked about backing up Swarm, and I just wanted to mention it again because I know that there's some Swarm fans on this chat, and I just wanted to get it out there, is that um, you should be backing up You know, any orchestrator, any tool that has a backend that is storing data that is persistent. You need to do that. And Swarm and Kubernetes are no different. And a lot of times people are not really sure because there is no like Docker backup command for Swarm, right? So at least not yet, that would be a cool thing. But they give you the techniques on how to do it. And they put that on the success site. So Docker, if you're not aware, has the success site. It's kind of like Microsoft's KB site where it's their official support documentation, different than the doc site, which is a little bit more about features and functionality, and the KB side is more about actual usage of the product, how to properly use it, best practices, how to things that are broken and how to fix them, or known issues and how to get around them, stuff like that. So check that out. Um, and I think, I think that's it for all of my news. So now that we have Michael uh, guest starring, actually, we haven't even had a chat about who this guy is. Where, what is Just he creeping doing on is. this? Why is he here? Why is he in that little corner of the screen? So uh, I'm going to switch uh, over to this thing. We're going to get rid of the browser for a minute. 
And uh, let's talk. So, hey, Michael, how you doing? Hey, Brett. How's it I'm, going? I'm Brett. We met what two years ago? Uh, it's probably about at least about that. Yeah, it's yeah, maybe just over a little over a year. It seems like forever. Uh, I, was, uh, I became a captain about two years ago now, so it's it's, it's been a little while now. Yeah, so we met at a DockerCon, right? Yeah. Yeah, the the center of the container universe at DockerCon. We uh, met because uh, I was a captain. Michael became a captain. Uh, we, if you are not aware, the Docker captains are this little group that Docker sort of promotes as the leaders of communities. It's kind of like the Microsoft MVP program, where you're they sort of uh, give you this special hat and this jacket that you know, like one of these jackets. And yeah, I didn't wear mine today. <sighs> yeah, I know it's well, it's winter, so I have to yeah. wear something. Uh, and the, the goal of it is really that we're constantly learning something new about Docker and we're constantly sharing it. So one of the key aspects of a captain is that they're sharing everything they know and it, that whether that's in blogs or in their tech talks or live on YouTube or whatever. So that's what we're doing here. And, uh, Michael actually is from Virginia tech, right? Yep. That's and where I am. what's your, what's your title there? What are you? It's officially it's actually still java developer right now but i'm i'm uh i'm, I'm working on changing that because I, I wear lots of hats so oh don't we all yeah so what do you do day to day like uh yeah. good question so i, I kind of tell everybody i'm 60 percent still a developer um so i'm still on a development team here at virginia tech um but in the other 40 percent of my time i'm doing kind of forward thinking so I, I work in the central division of it here and uh so thinking containers, cloud, kind of strategy, figuring out where do we go next? How do we help um, make sure our services, that we're ready to provide services to the rest of the university, that kind of stuff. So Cool. Um, so yeah, forward thinking, but also do a lot of training and mentoring and that kind of stuff. Run the local uh, Docker meetup here in town too. And um, yeah, it's just, just a few things. Yeah, so we're just a few hours apart, but we only see each other at conferences yeah. that are in nowhere in our area. <laughs> No, I know. Yeah, we're just a couple hours. I mean, my parents live like 45 minutes from me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Someday. And yet we see each other only when we're on the other side of the planet. So. That's right. We'll see each other in San Francisco in 50, 49 days, I think. You have a uh, countdown there. I, yeah, I'm not counting down. Uh, Jenny, our, our Admiral Jenny, is uh, was mentioning on Slack yesterday. We, she's like, I can't believe 50 days are left until DockerCon because we just felt like we were all at DockerCon in Barcelona. So, um, so... Uh, you run Docker Enterprise, right? So you have we Docker. Do, yes, here at Tech. Yep. Yeah, and you do you run Swarm and Kubernetes, or yes, but right now pretty much all of our workloads are Swarm only. Okay. Okay. So, yep. um, and you're you're uh, up on all the latest stuff with Docker. So tell us a little bit about Docker App. How before we even get into the demo, like what is this thing? Yeah, so good question. So Docker app was actually announced at uh, DockerCon in San Francisco last year. Um, and it was basically released as an experimental tool. Um, so they, they had this completely separate tool. It's not bundled into the engine or anything because they wanted to iterate, play around with it, and have fast release cycles in the engine itself. But the whole idea is, you know, we make compose files, and compose files define the services that need to run an application. But if I wanted to share an application with you, okay, so let's, let's take your dog versus cats, you know, voting app here. Okay, so if I wanted to share that with you, the only way that I could do that is to put it in a GitHub repo somewhere and you clone the repo, then do a stack deploy or compose off or, or something like that. Okay. Right. And, and so the, the team at Docker recognized it. They said, you know, if you really think about what an image is, an image is simply just a portable file system. Okay. And so, sure, we, we build container images that know how to run Nginx or Tomcat or um, PHP applications or Node apps you know, that are specifically tuned for this. But at the end of the day, it's really just a portable file system. Yeah. So what if we made a special version of an image that just contained a compose file? Okay. And so they built this tool that takes a compose file and basically puts it into an image and now shares it. And so that they call that a Docker app image. And so now all I have to do then is say, hey, Brett, pull this image, which you already know how to do because you've already got the Docker CLI installed and all that kind of stuff. Pull this image. And then so the Docker app tool 
We'll pull that image, recognize that, hey, this is a special image, extract the compose file out of it, and then do the stack deploy or a um, Docker compose up or, or whatever it is that you want from there. Um, so it's really just a way to share these compose files in a much easier way. So we're so it's a lot of reuse there, right? So the yeah. compose files in an image format, same as a regular image format, right? Yep. And it's and it's storing on an image registry like Docker Hub, same as always, right? Yep. And a lot of for for years, I mean, I'm sure you were thinking the same thing as I was years ago. I mean, there's been multiple attempts at a, you know, compose hub, right? Yeah. A place Absolutely. to share compose files. And Docker, instead of saying, well, we need a separate, instead of us all thinking that we needed something separate, Docker was like, well, let's just put it in its own image. And then it becomes its own unique artifact that is, you know, can be versioned or tagged just like uh, your code images. Yep. And that way you can deploy uh, sort of a multi-container solution the same way you would deploy a single image into a container, right? Absolutely. So yeah. you, I guess you've got some stuff for us. You want to show off? Yeah. How so, this works? Um, so, yeah, let me set everything up here. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Let me know when you've got it. Yep. Okay. Looking good. So, Docker app, as of today, anyways, is, as I mentioned earlier, is still a separate utility, a separate tool. Um, so, you can watch for releases. Now, I'm actually watching for everything because um, I'm keeping up with where Because you're going. obsessed. I know it. Um, but it's, it's moving so quickly still right now that it's it, it's good to know what's going on. Um, but you can download it, and they've got a pretty good write-up on how to do everything. I'm, I'm not going to go too much through how to actually create a Docker app, all that stuff. I want to kind of show you know, what it is that we're, we're doing with it. Um, but here's, here's the place to go. There's actually a pull request open right now that, that's being worked on to convert Docker app from being just a standalone utility to actually a plugin for the main Docker CLI. Um, so eventually it, it all kind of be integrated together, but um, who knows how soon that'll actually finish. But right. anyways, um, so you install it, um, you just download it, put it in somewhere that you can access it and go from there. Um, it's a single binary, right? So you're just downloading yeah, exactly. a, a binary. Um, so yeah. I, I actually took your, so you have an example on, if I close it, the uh, first cat here. Yes, I, I love that uh, domain that you have. That <laughs> the GitHub links are too long. They're too long. <laughs> I know. Um, and so at the bottom here, you actually have a, a voting Docker app. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so I'll just go through it real quick, just to explain it to people that are new here. Can you can you zoom in on that? Can you uh, yeah, zoom absolutely. in on Chrome? Yeah. There you go. Is that good. Thank you. All right. So with a Docker app, there's there's two different ways that you can deploy these. And this particular one, it's it's all in a single file. And you'll see that there are three sections to this file. And they're all um, delimited. They're all separated by just these three dashes. So the first spot is basically just metadata, just information about the Docker app. So you have a, a version. You've got the name of the app, a description, uh, the namespace, and then the list of maintainers. And then you've got all the services. and the second part here is just the normal Docker Compose file, okay? And you probably just lifted one of the ones that you already had and, and put it in here and did. didn't have to really yeah. change one. It's yeah. awesome. I, w I think I was trying to keep it in sync with the actual Docker Compose in there, but I maybe didn't. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, if you get notified of releases, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't think they're releasing that, but anyways. Yeah. Um, and so then the, this third section is for application settings, and I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. But so for right now, it's just an empty object. So you've got no settings, which is completely fine. And, and I'll show where that comes into play here in a minute. But so with, with, this, with this Docker app file, um, you know, you can deploy it. Um, let's go push. Okay, let's just scroll down here. Um, so if I had that clone, I could say Docker app push and I could tag it. And it's going to take that Docker app file and build that specific image and push that to Docker Hub. And you can change, you can again, push it to your own image registries. If you have your own private ones on prem or wherever else, you can push it to ECR, EKS, whatever, uh, EKS, um, you know, the Amazon, sorry, yes, yeah. or, or Azure or anywhere else. It, it, Any of the registries. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just a registry. Who cares? Um, so one, one of the things that I did is I, I took your Docker app file 
And I added a couple settings to it because I want to show how we're using Docker app here at Virginia Tech on the team that I'm on. Um, let me probably zoom in on this a little bit too. Because there's another actually really cool feature with Docker app that I don't think a lot of people know about. Okay, I'll make it a little bit wider. Okay. So with Docker app, let me... So it's like a superset of the Docker Compose YAML, right? Yeah. 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 And so if, if I've got this Docker app here, and again, it, when Docker app takes this Compose file, it's going to process it, and you can apply settings to it. And I can create settings to change ports and all this other kind of stuff. But one of the, the settings that's actually really cool is for each service, okay, I can add an X dash enabled attribute to it. And that's not normally there for Compose. Okay, this is a specific Docker app thing. But Compose will allow you to add any X dash. These are called extension fields. And you can just add your own metadata, your own stuff to it. Okay? And in this case, Docker app recognizes this X dash enabled. And if this is truthy, so if I have any sort of value to it over here, then this service will actually get deployed. Okay. And so I've got this for my vote app because I may I may do some development on it or whatever, um, and I'll explain kind of use cases here in a second. Vote the result I put another one, but it's got a different flag, so I can enable or disable these independent of each other. And then down in the settings, I define the default settings and just say I'm going to enable all of them. Okay. So what that allows me to do if I do a Docker app, so one of the commands is render, in which it's going to take the compose file and just render it out. Okay. Render it out to a, uh, just to, to, a, to a, as a, a compose, compose file. file. Yeah, okay. Okay. So Docker app render, and then here's my compose file. And any settings that I may have set are going to be applied. So if, if we actually look at those two particular ones, the result X enabled is true because, well, the default setting was true. Oh, now, so I, if it was false, I see. So if it was false, it just wouldn't even be in the output? Like yeah, it, this it, entire service would be gone. Right, Okay. And, and I can use settings for lots of different things to change ports, or maybe I want to have a different host name, a, a different base host name for all the, the apps or whatever. Um, and so settings allow you to change all that. Okay. Now, cool. so let's do the same thing. I'm going to do a render, but I'm going to set enable result to false. Okay. And now if I look in here, I, I don't have the result. When, when it renders it, it renders the services in alphabetical order. So I've okay. got Redis but I, yeah. and Vote, but I don't have results in here. Okay. So yeah, and I think that's a feature that people have been asking for in Docker Compose for a while. Like, how do yeah. I, you know, can I, can I control individual services or prevent certain things and all that? And it sounds like that really this is the solution for that, not waiting for a Docker Compose feature. Yeah, so what I could do, and I don't have the uh, proxy going, so it's not going to work. But so I can render this and then just pipe it directly to Docker Compose, say, read the file coming from standard in, and let me just do an op. Okay. And it's going to fail because I don't have the, the proxy network defined. Sure. I don't yeah. have the rest of it working. But at least try to run it. Okay. And so I, I can do some pretty cool stuff here. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this Docker app that I pulled from somewhere. Okay. In this case, I'm just using it locally. But imagine that right, you had created, you had pushed it to the registry. I'm going to pull that app. I'm going to apply different settings to it, and then I'm going to run it on, on my machine. Okay. So the Docker so the Docker app render and then piping that into Docker Compose, that would be good if you already had the Docker app file, that the dot Docker app file on your machine. But that's not always the case. Okay. Yeah. So in this case, since I'm, I'm not, let me look at the full Docker app. i do the help here. I can give it an app name, which app name could be a remote Docker app. So I could say, um, I actually pushed one up to voting.docker-app-010. Let's go fetch it. Oh, maybe I've got that. Um, OK, just had the wrong name. And so it's actually fetching from the remote registry from Docker Hub and then rendering that out. Very okay. cool. So that render command can take a local or remote. That's neat. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, this is a, a remote. Okay. Now, so one of the things I, I should have mentioned to you, so I could do a Docker app deploy, uh, voting app, Docker app, zero one zero. 
And what this is going to do is it's going to actually create the network and the services and everything. And so this is actually, so if I'm creating services, that means I'm deploying this as a swarm, swarm stack here. So this okay. would, this Docker app deploy in this case would replace a Docker stack deploy, right? Yeah, so this would replace the Docker stack deploy using a stack file that's on Hub right now. And that's a common question we get. In fact, someone in chat, Cody, is asking around, is Docker app going to be used in production? And I think that it's for both. There are both uses that you just saw piping into Docker Compose so that you can take that Docker app and then spit it out into Docker Compose file and run Docker Compose up all the same one liner or using this Docker app deploy, which is specifically designed for deploying stack files, but instead of deploying them from your like a local stack file that you happen to have on your machine, you're deploying it from an image in a registry, which it, that image stores the Docker app YAML, right? Absolutely. And, and you can also use the deploy with a Kubernetes orchestrator. So if I look at Docker app deploy at the help here, I can actually um, set the orchestrator to Kubernetes and, and it uses the composed to Kubernetes stuff and uh, can deploy to Kubernetes cluster as well too, which is pretty sweet too. Yeah, and we're having a lot, I mean, there's a lot of movement on that, right? Docker yeah. announced, uh, I think it was around DockerCon in December, right? They announced that they were open sourcing or they did open source the yep. Kubernetes, Compose for Kubernetes, I believe is what it's called, repo. Yeah, something and like that. yeah, and that means that you could now use this Docker app or any compose file to a Kubernetes cluster as similar to what you would use on a Swarm cluster. And you can simply change these. In fact, if you've even if recently, recent versions, you've played around with the Docker stack deploy command, you, you have those options in there as well. And you also have them here for the changing the orchestrator. In fact, you can even set the default orchestrator. Absolutely. So it's, it's Docker's trying to get this common high level abstraction of what an an app is right of a, of a stack of apps, I guess. And then trying to get that consensus across the different orchestrators so that we have, cause like you're experimenting and others are experimenting with running two types of orchestrators using swarm for certain types of things, using Kubernetes for other types of things and to have completely different, you know, workflows and files and configurations is tough. So I think it's really cool that Docker is experimenting with this. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry. I'll shut up. All good. So with this idea of being able to build a compose, so I'm getting excited now that you can tell. <laughs> uh, with having this, this compose file now that I can ship around, what other cool stuff can we do with it? And, and so what I'm about to show you is actually the reason we even started looking at Docker app in the first place. Because when, obviously when I first heard about it, I'm like, okay, that's cool. I can just run a single command to deploy WordPress. Awesome. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, okay, what, what else can I do with this? Um, and so we... The, the team that I'm on here, I, and I made a couple of little cheap slides here. Um, let me know if that's big enough there. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, so the, the development team that I'm on, we don't have a, a microservice application. It's just a single monolithic backend. But we have that backend exposes API, and then we have several different front-end clients. So we have, kind of have a desktop client. We have a, a mobile client that's still web-based. Uh, we've got an admin client. But all these different clients are different web-based front ends that are pointing back to the same API. So when we actually deploy our application, there's several different services. There's the API, then there's a desktop client, a mobile client, a, you know, a doc slash user guide. There's all these different things that we have to keep track of. And, and they're all in different repos. We use GitLab. Um, it's awesome. And so each of these different components are in different repos. Okay. And so as a developer, and I'm just going to walk this through and we'll, we'll see an example of it here in a second. So as a developer, they, they work on their code. They push their code to their, the repo for the component that they're working on. Um, the CI runners take off from there. And pretty much every component, we have it um, doing compiling if that's necessary. Then it runs a bunch of uh, unit tests, integration tests, that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, container images are built. They're pushed to a registry. And then one of the things that we do is we update a Docker app compose file and then we push that, okay? So what kind of changes are we making in that compose file? Okay, so next slide. All right, so in our compose file, so as Brett mentioned earlier, it, it's a bad idea to use latest for everything, okay, for images. So we tag all of our images with the git commit hash that was used to build that container image. Okay, so here's an example here. Um, we had a Docker 
the the compose or sorry the compose file for Docker app. You know, it was at Summit API. The, just the, the product we're working on is called Summit. So the API was at image tag three nine nine seven blah blah blah. A developer pushed code, and then what that did is it um, you know it built the container image and everything. And then as another step in that build, we update the compose file to say here's the latest version of the the API. Okay. So now we have a compose file that has the latest image tags for every component in the application. We've also taken this to another level too to say we have a different Docker app tag for each of the different feature branches that are working on, but that, uh, I'll have to defer how that works to a blog post. Um, but so again, think I'm working on the master branch. I push code. I've got a compose file that's got the latest versions of everything. And now I can basically take this Docker app and deploy the latest version of my application stack, regardless of who pushed code where. So as a developer, now if I want to start working on code, I can pull that compose file, and we, we call this summit in a box. Um, so I can pull summit in a box, disable the components I'm going to work on. So I mentioned earlier, okay, there's the API, there's um, a desktop client, there's docs, et cetera. Maybe I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to work on the user guide, the docs. Okay, so I, I want the latest versions of everything else. I'm going to disable the, the docs service. Okay, so I get latest versions of everything else with some in a box. I disable the docs. And then if I go into that component and do Docker Compose up, then I have a dev enabled version. And I'll do a demo of this here in just a second because it may be hard to kind of grok what I'm saying here. Um, but when I do Docker Compose up within that project, it's going to hook into all the networks and the proxy and everything else that came from the summit in a box from the main Docker app. All right. Okay. So demo time. All right, um, let's go over to this one. So let me do first, and we've made a little, just a little CLI command that just wraps Docker app anyways. But um, so if I do a, a summit um, config, what this is gonna do is it's gonna pull the Docker app and uh, run the render command, and then it pipes it to compose. So at the end of the, the, at the, end of the day, this is running a Docker compose config on a compose file that was generated from Docker app. So All right. we just kind of wrapped it. Um, and so here's the full Docker Compose. That's great. I'm not going to bore you with all the details there. But what I can do is I can say, all right, Summit, and I want to run these services. I want to disable, oops, I have guide spelled wrong. Docs user good. <laughs> yeah. um, it can be but, so I'm going to disable these services. And all these are doing are just setting the flags for what we saw earlier. We just built a little CLI GUI around it. Okay. Yeah. So I spin this up, and again, it's we see it's actually running Docker Compose F, and it, it piped the output to a, a file rather than just directly to standard in. And so I see these services spin up, again, using the latest Docker app that was produced by our CI system. Okay. But, you know, I'm working on docs. I didn't start up the docs. And so what I'm going to do in my docs repo is I'm going to do a Docker Compose up. While it's doing that, I'll, I'll show you what that compose file looks like. So for this, I'm defining a service. I define the image. This is just an mkdocs um, static site generator. I'm going to mount in my code, but I'm going to hook into the network that was defined. We just called it front end. And this was a network that was created from the Docker app. Okay. okay. And so that's why it's external here, because it's defined externally. And we just set the traffic labels, all that kind of stuff. So now if I go to docs summit local, oops, sorry, local summit, okay. here's, here's my app. Okay. And I know it's super fancy, I know. Um, but let, let's just go and change one of these files here. And let's make it, I always in my demos like to make things more exciting. And so I do that just by adding exclamation points. Um, so I'm going to update this. My local dev mode is running MK Docs. It's watching for file system changes. It's going to rebuild. Um, if I just start watching the logs down here, we'll see that it rebuilds. Um, and if I go back to my page and refresh, okay. uh, 
There it goes. All right. Now it's more exciting. Okay. It's but yet better. It's, it's, version can, version ten thousand. Exactly. And and yet so I can spin up if I can go to the other ones. So this is the the desktop client that's spun up. It's still spinning up the API, which is why there's configuration error. I haven't finished starting yet. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I'm using the latest version of all the other components that were built by the CI system. And all I have to do is I can use Docker app to spin up my app in a box. Right. And uh, and so then I disable the service that I'm actually going to do development on, spin up a dev ready container for that particular service, but hooks into the place where it would have been if I had just started from scratch. So this one tool is got a lot, it's got a lot. It's funny how little it does, but there's a lot to it. Right. And yeah. that's, I think that's one of the hardest things that a lot of us were, when we were first looking at Docker app was like, okay, I, I get what its functionality is, but the various ways to use it aren't exactly obvious. So it, it definitely yeah. can help you spit out compose files that are more flexible for local Docker compose use. It also has, so that that's the render command, right? And then it's got this ability to make images and then allow you to push those images up to a registry, right? Yeah. It's got, yeah. and it's making images not of your code, but of your compose file and any other, and, and I think there's other stuff that it puts, well, it puts the Docker app file in there and I'm not sure what else goes in that. You can image. bundle other config or other yeah. um, resources, that kind of stuff with it too. So yeah. if you're a, uh, you know, if, if your swarm stack is uh, using config files or something like that, you can actually bundle some kind of default config files with the app itself. Okay. And then it also does the deploy command, which allows you to push to a cluster that compose file that's inside that image with the various options and things that you can set on there. So that's it. And it, I'm sure it does more than that, right? <laughs> it's probably yeah. just a little bit. <laughs> A little bit of it, and then we've got a, we've got changes coming down the road. But um, I don't know that we have time to go into all the entire world of CNAB. That's probably a conversation yeah. for another day. Yeah. But there is sort of this coming soon stuff that we're going to talk about with um, like CNAB and the standard that Docker had announced. I, I don't know if you mentioned it yet. You might just want to. What is it? Yeah. So CNAB is is an attempt to kind of standardize it's, it stands for cloud native application bundling or bundle and it is basically a way or a specification on how can we package up um, cloud native applications yes some if i'm going to deploy an app part of the app is okay i'm going to deploy this on kubernetes but part of it's also well, i need to go set up this database in azure or uh, rds or whatever and so there's lots of different pieces that are actually needed to deploy a, an application. And so it's this attempt to basically put all that into a single spec and you can use whatever tools, okay, I use Terraform for this, but then I'm gonna use direct CLI commands for that or, or whatever, allow you to bundle all that together. Yeah. And we haven't really seen, I think it's it's still, I feel like in the, idea phase and not in the, we've got a bunch of tools that are very helpful and productive for you. It's more of a, it's a, it's a lot of theory and standardization and stuff like that. Yeah. The, the spec is still moving around quite a bit too. Um, so the, the spec was, this was also announced at DockerCon in Barcelona in December. There was a joint announcement between Docker and Microsoft. And, uh, and so since then many of the other uh, big players have, have jumped into and have decided, uh, all right, Hey, let's, Let's work together on this. And so, yeah, the spec is still evolving quite a bit. Yeah. And I know they have a website. I'm, I'm putting in chat the uh, Docker app link and then the CNAB link um, for, but, you know, Docker app is something you can get productive with today. And CNAB is more about the standardization across all different types of APIs that we create for creating these types of different abstractions. So it's a little bit more esoteric, maybe not something that you can get really productive with right away, but if you want to read the background on it, it's pretty interesting on the thought process from Gareth and other people in the community that are sort of leading this effort. So- And, um, and I imagine too, we'll hear a, quite an update at DockerCon in yeah. 50, 49 days. 49 days, right, <laughs> right. So uh, thank you everyone in the chat for listing your questions. Um, I guess this is the time where we put Michael on the hot seat and see if he can Let's answer a bunch of your questions. <laughs> 27. So, yeah. 
So I'm going to scroll away to the top, and the way this works is we are uh, going to take a few minutes to answer as many questions as possible. And if we don't get to your questions, hang around and chat even after the video is over because we'll basically we're, we'll be cutting off the live stream at some point, and then we can still hang around and chat and answer questions in the YouTube live chat. So don't refresh the page or go somewhere else. Just leave it open if you have to leave your desk or whatever. That's fine. And then come back later, and you might see the answers to your questions if we didn't get to them in the video stream. So, all right, so let me see if I can find a good first question here. Uh, Rob asks, what is the best simple, clean file management system for shared volumes across a swarm cluster? Have you ever used storage OS? This is for very small clusters, three to five nodes. What do you think? Am I answering that or you? Yeah, you are. <laughs> you are. <laughs> I'm giving uh, you the question, sir. <laughs> no, that's fine. I mean, so I, I will admit I haven't used storage OS, um, so I, I don't know. If Neither you have I. Well, but, um, honestly, for most of on tech campus anyways, we've got a, a NetApp storage array. So pretty much all of our stuff, we're, we're using NetApp for that. Um, but yeah, the idea is kind of just yeah, get it off the box, have some sort of network share. I know Brett's a big fan of Rexray and uh, talks about that quite often and uh, has lots of capabilities to do things or um, getting your volumes off the host machine itself. But um, so yeah, and I, I think it's really just gonna depend on what what you have available to you. You know, if you're running AWS, so you've got a certain set of tools. If you're in Azure, you've got another set of tools. But um, yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I'm looking up storage OS real quick. Um, so I, I like to lump it, um, I like to lump it in two different types of buckets for storage. Either you're using existing storage that you have on the network, and whether that's iSCSI or NAS or you know Fiber Channel or some sort of proprietary protocol, something, some sort of thing on Windows that SIFs, uh, SMB share, Samba shares. There's all types of file sharing protocols, and some of them are exclusive, where you can only connect to one host at a time, and that's focused. That's that's nothing to do with Docker. This is all just pure storage. Because Docker doesn't really change any of the rules of storage. It just is what it's the tool that helps you use plugins to connect your containers to storage that you might have. Really, it's not going to give you any new capabilities in storage. Um, so you have to decide if you're going to use those kind of shared storages, which are usually like NetApp, right? Uh, other Dell EMC things and all these other sort of options out there. There's lots of that stuff. Some of them have Docker plugins and you would pl add those plugins on all your nodes and then you could use that storage for your containers, whether that's Docker Run or Swarm or whatever. And then there's the other bucket, which is getting some sort of software protocol that replicates or moves data around different nodes. So it doesn't require specialized hardware or something off server. It just replicates like Ceph or other tools. There's open source tools. There's port works and paid tools like that. I'm not sure which bucket the storage OS is in. It might do replication or it might uh, provide. There's there's um, an acronym I'm, I'm forgetting or a term for shared nothing storage, which is I used to be all about left hand before HP bottom way a decade ago. Left hand was all about putting software on your servers and then that any spare space on your servers could be used for any other servers for shared storage on the network. And I think that's called shared nothing storage. But there's all sorts of storage, ar storage architectures, and you can use just about any of those that I can think of in containers. It's just a question of how do you get your cluster to it? So Swarm isn't necessarily special. It can use any of those storage systems. But usually what you want to do is you want to have the container when Swarm scheduled a task, whatever node it decides to put that task on for your service, you need the storage over there, right? So the job of a storage orchestrator like Rexray um, is to get the storage connected to the node where it needs to be used for that container. And some people don't use something like that. They just use regular plugins or regular even just mounting stuff hard onto a server like manual EBS mounting or something like that. They might just do that on the host if they're pinning containers right on that node, right? If they're just hard coding those. But most of us that are trying to be flexible and create a cluster that allows things to move around, we can't do that. So Rexray is one of those tools 
that can solve that problem. Another way is to replicate. Now, Rexray doesn't provide you the storage. It just acts as a go-between between your containers and some other storage back in, like NetApp or cloud storage, like EFS or EBS or DigitalOcean's block storage or whatever, right? So um, I have not used Storage OS, so I don't have any recommendations on that. My recommendation is it's not hard to try, right? You can Most of these things, either they're free or you can download demos of them and you can install them into a three node swarm, upload your, you know, use your, use Docker app to <laughs> load up your compose <laughs> sure. files, run your stacks and just see if it works, right? You can, you can create this all in virtualization. Usually you don't need pure dedicated hardware unless you're trying to use something like NetApp or some other piece of dedicated hardware where you have to ask a storage person for an iSCSI LUN and, you know, those things. So, uh, it, yeah, it's not hard to try. I recommend playing around with lots of these tools before you commit to something because storage can be one of those things where it seems like it's working and then it stops working and it's related, like net. All these tools are not bug free, right? Rexray has had issues. I someone uh, pointed out, and then I discovered on my own an issue on DigitalOcean block storage, where if you disconnect storage and reconnect it multiple times by moving containers around, the node may eventually not be able to reconnect the the block storage until you reboot the node. And I think that's something to do with the driver bug and the. So anyway, doesn't mean it's not worth trying. It just means that you need to do things like. Fail your nodes to see if that even works. Fail your apps to see if the storage rolls over and stuff like that. So hopefully that helps. Um, all right, let's see the next question. Uh, Hill says, right now I run five different WAR files in JBoss, when I, which I then connect to Postgres databases on some server. I am looking at Compose, actually going through that course at the moment, to set it up. The question I have is, should I create multiple JBoss containers with Compose or just continue running all five in one. In production, mm -hmm. we have five different JBoss servers. So, I th I would say try both. If you have five different WAR files in JBoss, without being a Java expert, I mean you're the Java guy. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I could talk a little bit to this, anyways. Um, so my recommendation. Has, has typically been, all right, don't, don't boil the ocean. And I know Brett says this often too, do what you're already comfortable with, do what you already know. Um, if, if that's, all right, we already have lots of tooling and everything around. We've got a single JBoss server that has lots of war files in it. And, and, and we know how to work with that. We know how to instrument it and everything. Great, Dude, get that containerized and, and start working from there. Personally, I, I'm a, a fan of splitting that out into, to multiple containers. Um, and so that would probably be a long-term approach um, because I imagine for the most part, you're if you update one, do you need to redeploy the other four? Mm -hmm. And so if they're all in separate containers, you can deploy one, you can roll out updates to one without having to bring down the others. They're, they're all independent from each other. Yes, that means you have additional overhead. You're now running five JBoss servers instead of just one. But I think at the end of the day, there's not that much difference. I mean, the JBoss application server sure does have some overhead, but uh, I would, and again, I don't know your app, but at least in my experience, the, the amount of overhead from the application server in comparison to the app itself is quite low. That most of the CPU memory uh, utilization, all that kind of stuff is coming from the app, not from the server itself. So running multiple instances of JBoss probably isn't going to hurt you. But again, I, I don't know your, your exact situation too. Yeah. And I think that, you know, getting, getting server resources for that is probably easier, probably less of an issue than the, the gain, the abilities you gain by having the flexibility, right? Like you can yep. scale one without scaling the others. You can replace one without replacing the others. Like, I think this is in general, this, this question is very similar, right? To other questions we get about a couple, a couple weeks ago, we had people asking, well, if I have a bunch of Apache websites, should I run them all in Apache virtual servers or should I split them out into separate containers? And my answer was very similar to yours, Michael, that I would, you know, it all would work in one, but eventually I would be splitting them out in separate containers because containers provide that level of isolation and uh, artifacts that gives me the flexibility for distributed computing where I can, you know, we, we can't really ever get to and to microservices. And this necessarily doesn't mean that your JBoss is microservice yet, but... You know, to me, there is there's a 
there's a wide array of size of applications. And as we start splitting things up or making different repli uh, you know, applications that run separately, whether it's a war file or something else, the more we split these and isolate these things out, generally the more flexibility, the easier it is to get uptime, the easier it is to troubleshoot. It, it's not perfect. They're, not everything is better, right? Yep, you have yep. sometimes duplication of effort. You end up with more things you got to manage. You got maybe a little bit harder network troubleshooting. Depending on how your apps work, it might affect performance if they're across the network instead of in the same machine. So there's lots of things to consider. But in general, we're all evolving into a way where we're splitting things out more and more and more when it makes sense. And I, yep. yeah. And, and from my experience too, um, and again, this may not be your experience or what's going on here, but you know, we've had several Tomcat containers or Tomcat servers that had lots of war files in it. And we simply did that because it was convenient that the time to, to spin up a new machine, to set up a new Tomcat instance, all that stuff was, it was a lot of overhead in the past. And so it was like, fine, I don't want to do that. I'm just going to deploy another war file to this other one. It's already running. It's good enough. Um, and so yeah. that was more to, to reduce the ops overhead and the amount of time to spin things up. But now, yeah, as you become more familiar with containers and everything, that overhead doesn't really exist anymore because now it's earlier in the process. You're building these container images, and, and it's easier to, to spin things up. So, um, yeah, that's – Yeah, <laughs> that's a good – and it's a good question. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we get the same question about databases. Should I put all of my databases into one MySQL server, or should I have multiple MySQL containers? And I would say this depends. Like, what what is your motivation? That the cheapest thing to do is to put them all in one because it's lower memory overhead. It's you know probably a little less redundancy and on in terms of uh, the, the necessary things you need to run. But most of us are splitting things out when we can in order to gain flexibility. Really. Um, next question. Rito asks, uh, updating the endpoint mode of a swarm service from DNSRR to VIP needs a complete recreate of the service. We yeah. see service instances not reachable anymore. Not sure what the service instances are doing while in updating process. So should that be possible or not? Any thoughts about this? Um, I'm not really sure if you're talking about a service update having a problem or if you replacing the service to change the endpoint. Um, when you say a complete recreate of a service, you can't change the endpoint mode with an update. I thought you could. Yeah. Uh, I thought you could too. It maybe it's, maybe it isn't possible. Um, not, so the service instances are doing what's an updating process. So I'm not really sure. I mean, obviously if you take a service down and you replace it, there's an outage, right? Like that's yeah. that's gonna you're gonna be down. Um, if you're talking about a service update, did you try it? I'm sorry. Were yeah, you... well, it's at least in the documentation that the uh, endpoint modes a flag on service update. So. Okay, so yeah, so you should be able to change it in a service update, but. Uh, yeah, it's still we gonna see, have to rotate those containers. We see service instances not reachable anymore. So I would say, changing from. So here's, here's what I'm understanding from your question. I'm going to extrapolate and hope that I'm getting it right. I think what you're saying or asking is you're doing a service update and changing the, the endpoint mode, and that's causing an outage. I'm just going to punt and say maybe that won't work with rolling updates and giving you true high availability. Like changing the endpoint mode does seem kind of tricky to do on something that needs to be zero downtime. Um so normally I get into my preaching mode about, you know, the default is VIP, which means you have this load balancer and swarm that sits in front of it and it redirects the traffic based on each new connection. It goes to the new container, right? That's VIP mode. In DNS RR, that's just round robin. It just, it doesn't have a load balancer in front. So it's a little less um, feature, rich, feature rich and it doesn't have the functionality necessarily to ensure always up uh, connections because the load balancer acts as that way to, uh, is in connections for a certain container before that container goes down so that you can then replace it. So it hopefully you're gracefully moving connections over. So that all that's stuff that you gain with VIP. I don't know how you would do that in DNS RR unless you were doing it in your app. And that requires that you really know a lot about how your app works, how it ends connections, how connections will stop on that particular container. And that's just a little more tricky. So my assumption is there's probably not a way to do zero downtime when changing update mode in 
for in endpoints, right? <laughs> I, yeah. That's not something I've really tried to. Yeah, that's and that also seems like a very rare case. Like I, I don't think changing yeah. endpoint mode is something that people do regularly. In fact, I've never heard of anyone doing that. So probably not a tested scenario in terms of zero zero downtime deployment. So um <laughs> so I, I don't know if you're reading through the uh the comments of Pelin soon you keep using that word that was in, in reference to uh your node course <laughs> <laughs> i saw that come up and started laughing when i saw it i do i do use the word soon and that's why i don't give dates because i'm always wrong so i just don't i don't give them basically the the course is going to be the best quality i can make it and if that means it takes longer but it's actively being worked on by a team of people every week. So just so you know, um, I'm excited for it. Yeah, it's it's real. <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna happen. Uh, it it by goodness better happen before DockerCon because I will be highly upset if I go to DockerCon and don't have that course finished. But the goal was this month. Um, I think if you'd asked me eight months ago, the goal would have been like November. But um, we you know vacations happened, Christmas happened, things happened, right? Dogs get happen, dogs. get a puppy. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's funny. Yes. I don't think that word means what you think it means. Uh, that's from the Princess Bride. I'm probably not saying the correct quote, but uh, let's see. Hello. Oh, Hill saying he's, uh, they are um, doing Dr. Composer section of mastery. Cool, cool. Uh, all right. Two more questions and then we got to run. Um, what are the best practices? For what? schema changes and data migrations to a live database for applications running on Docker Swarm cluster. Ooh, this is a good one. Is there any Docker image to use just to execute the necessary SQL statements from the migration and then exit? Yes, mm. another Postgres container. Yep. <laughs> so uh, think about a Postgres container, right? What's in there? Well, it's the Postgres database and then the Postgres clients, right? The, the CLI and all the, you know, the, the import, export, dump, re re restore, whatever the term is for... Postgres is stuff, right? Um, so if you want another container to mount in some import stuff, like some schema updates, and then you want it to, instead of running the daemon for the Postgres server to run the client against a remote container over the network, that's what you do. In fact, there's an example of that. What? And, you know... You get one guess on where I'm going to go in my Docker uh, dog versus cat repo. So Ooh. in dog versus cat, um, inside of my ghost, let's see, let's do the ghost stack ghost stack. Oh, here we go. No, not the SQL light. Wait, and you have a ghost Docker wrap? I just saw that go by to you. Yes, I could do that too. But I'm not sure which one it's it's based on. All right, so on this one, <laughs> oh I know, yeah yeah. So let me zoom in here so we can. Uh... So basically, uh, doing schema updates to me is exactly the same type of work as doing restores or backups because what your your goal is is that you have files you need to get either in or out, and you need to talk to the database and use client utilities to talk to that client data that database. And you really have a couple of choices. One is you you execute you do a Docker exec in the container that the SQL Server is running. Um, that is a little tougher in a cluster when you're talking about Swarm because now you got to figure out where does that container live and I have to go find the node where it lives and I have to run a Docker exec on that container there, right? What I prefer to do is to just use the overlay networks and talk to it using the client utilities over the network from anywhere, using a, creating another service, making sure it's on the same overlay network, and then figuring out how to get to that database and do what I got to do. So in my example here, it's pretty easy and contrived, but essentially... This is a database to run a website. So it's running the official MySQL image, and then it's mounting the database like normal. But I run this other service that simply overwrites the command. So if you see here, it overwrites the command with a one-line shell uh, loop, essentially, that will then run the MySQL dump utility against a remote DNS name. And if I... Go all the way over, you'll see it's it knows the host name of the other service because that's the service name. So it knows it's always going to be called DB, and it's going to make a file using a nice 
date value that you can use in a shell script. And then I, I'm really lame because I'm using a one-liner shell script, and I just sleep it for whatever that is, five minutes. No, that's 15 minutes. What is that? An hour. That's an hour. Yeah, hour. I think it's an hour. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're good at math. <laughs> um, and, and it actually brings in the Docker secrets value as the password so that you don't have to have the password hard coded. If you're using Docker Swarm Secrets, it will gain it that way. So that's a really little easy example. And then it mounts uh, a different volume that I'm using Rexray to store that off disk. So it's using Rexray to find DigitalOcean block storage and then it mounts a different volume that's just for backups. And it it there's nothing fancy about it. It doesn't have advanced uh, you know, monitoring or logic to it. It just simply runs a dump command, puts it in a file every hour, and then repeats. And that hopefully will get you enough of the way to the, con the conceptual issues around how do I talk to my database to do things like schema updates. Yeah. So one thing I'll just add to you. Yeah. So since we just uh, had a 12-factor talk in our local meetup here recently, um, one of the uh, and if you haven't heard of 12-factor, I strongly encourage you to go check it out. Um, I'm going to post a link to this specific pillar, but there's actually a, a pillar. Uh, one of the factors is exactly on this, that when doing um, database backups or schema changes, that kind of stuff, that those are, should be um, kind of one-off functions that, that run. And so in this case, uh, Brett's got another service that's doing the, the backup. Um, and in your case, you may have a, a service that's doing the, the schema update. One, one of the things that... Uh, so we've got a team that, that's doing something very similar. Um, and the stack file that he's got there, he's got the deploy restart policy to 600 seconds. So if it died, 10 minutes later, it's gonna, it'll automatically reschedule. And that makes sense for a backup. You want that to just keep going. Um, for a schema, you may not want that. And so you can set your restart policy to have a condition of none. And so it's never gonna restart, but then maybe the next time you do your deploy, um, you change environment variable or something like that to say, here's a new version number, some way to trigger it to, to go um, to launch it from there. Yeah, so hopefully you have that anyways. <laughs> Yep. It's, yeah. Weird. Tug on it. I wonder how long that's. I was muting because there's a jet overhead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there was a jet flying over. I'm near a jet base and it was flying overhead, so I muted myself and I forgot. Um. Uh, so the question. Let's go back to the question real quick. Uh, <laughs> Pascal Andy is saying, "Awesome show." Until just now, when I screwed up with the mic. Uh, what's your process when you have to update and reboot your Linux nodes? To change the challenge is when you're doing a Docker node update on a swarm of dash dash availability drain. Those services shut down for a few minutes. It's not doing a rolling update. So that's a great question, and I actually have a question for you. And um, 
is this a case where you only have one container, one task in the service? Because that's true. If you have stop first as the default, right? If you're stopping a container because it's in that task and it's on a node that's stopping or draining, then it's going to stop that before it's creating a new one. So then you potentially could be down for a few seconds or however long it takes for your containers to start, essentially. Unless they have to download images on a different node, then obviously that takes download time as well. If you're talking about a multi task, a multi-replica service, uh, as far as I know, that does not create an outage. I could be wrong, but the way that should be working is the load balancer, assuming you're in the VIP mode by default with overlaid networking, that load balancer, when there's a command to start shutting down that task, that task's health check and everything should be there and properly working, and the, the load balancer will remove it from connections or future new connections, right? So that new connections won't be going to that task as it's shutting down. That's going to happen across all the tasks on that node. If you don't have multiple replicas, then you're kind of just in a pickle anyway, unless you can do uh, temporarily multiple replicas, right? Uh, if you're talking about stuff like databases, well, then that's when you have to have database replication built in, right? You have to have a, a a mirror for your database or a replica, however, whichever database technology you're using, you have to do that at the app level. Uh, Swarm is not going to solve that problem for you. So um, this is all really something that definitely needs to be tested because every app is going to be different. Every app behaves differently with connections. Every app is going to have different ways for load balancing or fault tolerance at the different tiers. And, and, and I'm sure, Pascal, you know that. Uh, he does some great work, by the way, if anyone in the audience doesn't know, on Swarm. He puts out stuff on Swarm and Ghost. He's also a fan of Ghost blogging. So mm -hmm. we talk about that on GitHub all the time. We're, we're both usually watching the same GitHub issues related to Swarm and Ghost and stuff like that. So I might be wrong on that. Um, maybe find me offline, Pascal, if you're looking at, if you have an, an actual bug that where if you're doing a drain and it's preventing high availability on the VIP, then that's definitely, I would consider a bug because uh, drains should not cause that, assuming your apps are all set up correctly for high availability and failover. Um, so thanks so much for watching. We are running out of time, so we're going to hang around and chat for a few minutes and hopefully answer any more questions we didn't get to. This has been, you know, we've been here an hour and a half, so we definitely don't want to wear ourselves out on YouTube live streaming. That's what Twitch is for. Twitch is for the three-hour marathon That's right. um, video. So I thank everyone for coming. Again, if your questions weren't uh, answered, just hang out in live chat, and we'll uh, answer them afterwards. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, for being on the call. I'm Thanks sure we're going to have you again. Like, this is going to be a thing <laughs> now. Let's do it. That we're going to have it. And then someday we're going to have it in the real world. We're actually in the same room because we're... That's right. We're so close, we could almost yell at each other. So <laughs> thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next week on Docker and DevOps Live or whatever I want to call this show when it launches next week. Make sure you subscribe and click the like button or the little uh, the dinner bell thingy down there so you'll know when we go live, and I'll see you soon on the internet. Have a good one.